superheroes that will be that will be sharing all of their great insight with us today. So we're really going to start off by um, asking each of our panelists to please introduce yourself, provide a little bit about your background and the scope of your organization. And if you don't mind, Shannon, I'll start with you. I don't mind at all, but I wonder what would happen if I say I did. <laughs> <laughs> You'll still do it. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're right, I will. <laughs> um, my name is Shannon Raybuck. I am the mental health care coordinator at the Fauquier Free Clinic. We offer integrated medical, mental health, and dental care for individuals in Fauquier and Rappahannock County that either have Medicaid um, or who are uninsured. Our dental clinic does see individuals with Medicare. They see children as well. Our medical and mental health clinic see um, adults 18 and over. I am a licensed professional counselor, and I have been in this role since um, 2016, and I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you, Shannon. And then I'm going to go ahead with Lieutenant Marshall, if you can introduce yourself, please. Sure. I'm Andy Marshall uh, with Fauquier County Sheriff's Office. I am a lieutenant, uh, primarily assigned to the patrol division. My primary responsibility is assistant division commander for the, uh, the patrol division. Years ago, uh, somehow I caught the ball for mental health, and I've been kind of running with everything mental health related ever since within the agency. Perfect. Donna? I'm sorry, they're like mowing around outside my window, so I hope you can hear me. <laughs> I'm Donna Guzman. Um, I am currently student services supervisor with Fauquier County Public Schools. Um, I am also the VTSS coordinator, which um, has a mental health component in it. Um, I um, oversee our elementary school counselors, um, been in education for 23 years um, from elementary. Uh, I was a teacher um, and then I was a high school assistant principal and a middle school principal and now in this role. Um, so I've definitely had a lot of time um, with students and families and um, experiences and I I hope I can be helpful today. Perfect. Thank you. And Alec. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Alec Burnett. I'm the uh, president of the Fuck Your Chamber of Commerce and uh, happy to support, obviously, any initiatives that surround, you know, the uh, the well-being of our of our citizens in, in, in whole. Uh, but certainly uh, it has a it has a direct economic impact uh, on our small businesses. Um, and so anything that uh, we can do as a chamber to advocate for and assist in um, remedying some of the challenges that we're currently facing right now, um, I am 1000% in support. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you all very much for introducing yourselves. And we're going to get the show on the road. So we'll start with Shannon, actually. <laughs> All Once right. again, yeah. So you are widely regarded as a mental health superwoman in this community. Yes, you hey. are. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, the Fakir Free Clinic is on the front lines of how mental health is being triaged in the community. Can you tell us about interesting data you've uncovered and how social determinants of health predict or correlate to the state of mental health in our community? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I actually have um, a PowerPoint of our data that we collected. We've been collecting social determinants of health data for two years now. Um, we use the prepare and we, we survey each one of our patients annually. Um, so we now have two years worth of data um, and I'd be happy to share a little bit of that. I don't know if I have screen sharing superpower ability. Is that? You're good to go. Okay, excellent. Okay, now bear with me because I have like multiple monitors here. And so this always blows my mind a little bit when it's time to, to do this. Okay, let me see. I think I'm okay. Oh my gosh, did I do it right the first time? Okay, so <laughs> um, we started looking at social determinants of health because we knew that, oh, there we go. Oh gosh, now did I do it right again? Okay, fantastic. Sorry. <laughs> um, are you seeing the actual screen or are you seeing my, my notes screen? Actual screen of the chart. Okay, perfect. Okay, it's showing me two different things. Um, technology immigrant, not native uh, <laughs> over here. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, we started kind of measuring social determinants of health as more and more research was coming out about the, the impact that it had on both mental health oral health, and as well as an individual's physical health. And we really wanted to know what our patients 
we're facing in terms of barriers to care and barriers to living the life they deserve. Um, so, you know, the first couple of slides are just, you know, the, you know, visit numbers. So I'm going to kind of breeze by those. If you didn't hear about our dental expansion to help more folks, we had it. It's great. It's happening. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to kind of dive right into the prepare. Um, and for anybody who has not seen it before, this is, this is what the prepare looks like. It's 21 questions. And really what we're asking is, you know, what is your race, ethnicity? What language do you sp speak? Um, and what are potential barriers to care, transportation, housing, clothing, child care? Um, we chose the prepare for two reasons. One is that our electronic health record uploaded that, so it was easy for us to pull this data, but also roughly 53% of healthcare centers are utilizing this screening tool. So we felt like this would help us figure out what was going on um, and comparing our, you know, what we were seeing here to trends in other communities. Since we've started doing this, the local health department has also started a community health care worker program with the, um, with the free clinics in their footprint. So Culpepper, Orange, Madison, Rappahannock, and they're also utilizing prepare data. So we're looking forward to the end of this year to see how Fauquier is kind of um, comparing with, with the responses and the concerns in those other, um, in those other communities. Um, one thing that I would wanna point out since our first year to this year is that we've had an almost a 10% increase in patients who identify as Hispanic or Latino in one year. Um, this is significant because we've also seen a significant increase in individuals who feel comfortable speaking a language other than English. So in terms of accessing mental health care, in terms of accessing social supports, you know, um, connectedness with providers, mm -hmm. we have a shortage of Spanish speaking mental health providers in our community. Um, and when I say shortage, I'm not sure that we really have any others outside of the two telehealth providers we have at the free clinic. Um, these individuals experience trauma, they experience social isolation, they experience, um, you know, depression and, and situations that would warrant mental health intervention, but they don't have access to care in a language that is comfortable for them in their, in, in, in their native language. And when you don't have a consistent interpreter, for example, and you have a language line interpreter every visit and somebody else there, I can only imagine that it is even more difficult for these um, mental health visits to be as fruitful as they could be because you're having to share a lot of very vulnerable information with a stranger, maybe through a phone or a video or a tablet. Um, so this has been, this was kind of surprising for us, this number of um, this increase over the past year. We did not see a, a large difference in individuals who reported struggling with housing. 12% of our patients do not have housing. That's defined in this screening as individuals who are staying with friends, kind of couch hopping, sleeping in cars, living in a motel or a shelter, um, living on the street or in a park. But we also have a significant number of individuals who are concerned about losing housing. Um, this has increased over the past year. And I think that that is correlated with the end of the COVID funding. There was a lot of that funding that helped our, our patients access motels um, during the pandemic. And when that funding went away, these patients had nowhere to go. So I think that that's why we see this increase from last year to this year. 40% um, of, our, of our patients are unemployed. Um, and then we also have individuals who are you know, not looking for employment. That's a small, the smallest percentage of 9%. And then a little over half of our um, patients are employed either full or part-time. We always like to, again, know what, what barriers to patients have. And we were, you know, we haven't seen much change over the year, you know, last year to this year that, you know, almost 20% of our patients have been unable to get food when they need it. Um, they don't have transportation to get to where they need to go. So how are they gonna access peers? How are they gonna access mental health services or, or things like that if they, if they don't know how to get there? Um, we also uh, ask people, do they feel safe where they live? And about 9% of our patients don't feel safe where they live and 4% are unsure 
if it's a safe environment. Sometimes this is due to domestic violence um, or domestic partner violence. Sometimes it's due to feeling unsafe in the neighborhood. Um, so we kind of see a blend of both of those. And similar with, um, have you felt afraid of your partner or ex-partner in the past year? And 5% of our patients have, have not felt safe with their partner. Um, what I really would like to highlight is this slide here. Um, we ask individuals about their social connectedness, right? And that's a, it's a large part of what we're talking about today is social isolation and social connectedness and that impact of loneliness. And we were wondering what our data may have looked like had we started gathering this before the pandemic, but we didn't. So, <laughs> so we know that in 2021, 19% of our free clinic patients had less than one significant interaction per week with someone they felt connected to, with someone they felt safe to. So that's zero to one <laughs> interactions per week. We were hoping as pandemic, you know, kind of restrictions lifted that that number would decrease. And we were kind of surprised to see that it increased the following year to 21%. Um, and 27% of our patients are only having one or two significant interactions with somebody they care about each week. And we know that there is a direct correlation between loneliness and again, emotional health, as well as physical health. I, I remember hearing Renee speaking just last week that I believe the, the Surgeon General equated loneliness, you know, being lonely and being socially isolated to the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And if I misquoted that, please somebody correct me, but I was just, I was blown away by that. Thank you, all right. <laughs> I'm so glad I was sitting at the front of the class that day. Um, <laughs> you know, and so I think that this is something that, you know, I think we all kind of think about, but don't really know what to do about. And all of this is important for us as we're looking at mental health and wellness and physical health. I mean, why, why am I going to care about getting socially connected or taking care of my anxiety or, or my depression or my diabetes or my blood pressure or going to get my teeth cleaned when I don't know how to get there because I don't have transportation or because I'm trying to figure out how to get food or because I can't take time off work or find childcare. So these social drivers of health, you know, they've shifted the language from determinants to driver because it really does drive that access and it drives that individual's ability to be fully present with their provider and to, to seek out these resources and these supports. Um, you know, and, and sorry, I'll come back to this. Rob wants everybody to know about people on smile. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna stop back over here for a second. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, when we look at things like the Surgeon General's recent report on loneliness and, you know, kind of getting socially connected, I, we see that direct correlation with increased depression rates here at the free clinic with increased anxiety. Um, and again, kind of tying back into not being able to get those other needs met. They don't even know who to call. So when I have an individual who's feeling isolated, they're feeling lonely, um, but they're also depressed, it's very hard to help them find that motivation to go, you know, so we can hear about these amazing community events like Alec was just talking about. And I can say, well, there's this really awesome event where you can go and you can bowl, bowl and support your community. But when they have social anxiety, um, or when they have experienced trauma, or if perhaps they're new to our country or don't know if there's gonna be other people there who speak their language, it's very difficult to kind of access those supports for them and help them get motivated. So that, that impact of the mental health diagnosis on the ability to kind of become beyond that loneliness is something that we see. And there have not been a, a lot of substantial community resources that I can route them to. You know, our, um, our elderly patients are aware of the senior center, you know, and they can kind of access peer there. There's transportation to get there. The C center in Culpeper is a wonderful resource if you have transportation to get there. Um, so, you know, I, I just kind of bring all of this to say, you know, I would kind of, you know, to use Renee's word, send out a call to action of how can we as a community and how can those of us here in this conversation 
figure out ways to continue to get our community together. There's amazing programs out there, but let's recognize the barriers folks have to getting there. You know, Remington Community Garden is an amazing, amazing resource. We all know that being outside and in the fresh air and the, and the therapeutic um, impact of that. But again, if, if you don't know how to call the on-demand bus and get that 24-hour reservation to get you from one side of the county to the other, then, you know, how, how do we kind of bridge those gaps? Um, and so that Rob doesn't come hunt me down <laughs> and sit in his bones like, like a parent when the thermostat changes. Um, Piedmont Smiles is our community dental event. We will offer it again this year on Saturday, October 7th. Um, it will be free dental care for anybody who, who comes and who needs it. Yeah. And it starts with, with, with a dental as well. I think a lot of times people forget that that really affects mental health. If you have a toothache, your, your mental state is not going to be okay. So having a Piedmont Smiles Day again this year is great way to, to really get in touch with those people that need dental care and other resources as well. So um, absolutely. Thanks for plugging that in, Shannon. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for that information. We're going to go ahead and move along to um, law enforcement. Enforcement. Lieutenant Marshall, we know your team, along with other first responders, are the front lines for dealing with individuals in crisis. We really do applaud Sergeant Kamer, who recently won the Valor Award and is intervened to prevent an attempted suicide uh, recently. Um, we presume this is just one example of heroism and the situations law enforcement are encounter encountering regularly. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing now compared to before and during the pandemic? Sure. Uh, just to cover a couple of definitions, as I talk about this stuff, sometimes I might fall into acronyms and abbreviations. And so let me throw out some definitions real quick. And Bridget promised me that if I really started speaking a strange language, she would put a, uh, an explanation in the comments field. But <laughs> to, to the comments or the, the terms that we use a lot in law enforcement or the, or the legal realm of the mental health side is uh, an ECO, which stands for Emergency Custody Order. Kind of my uh, simplified explanation of that is that's when we place an individual into custody involuntarily for the purpose of an evaluation by a behavioral health specialist. Um, that process is intended to last no longer than eight hours. It's just us taking them into custody, taking them to a facility, putting them before a specialist and determine whether uh, additional treatment is needed. Um, another term that we use often is TDO, which stands for temporary detention order. That is when we place an individual in custody involuntarily for the purpose of treatment at a mental health facility or medical facility. The intent there is that that should not last them longer than 72 hours. And I'll kind of talk, speak to that later on, on kind of what those times have morphed into and kind of where the, the system has broken down. But those are kind of the two uh, legal courses that give us authority to kind of dabble in the mental health world. Obviously, it's not um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether it, it, it truly is a, a law enforcement function or whether it's better served elsewhere. Um, but those are the two kind of legal processes that kind of get our hands into the mix. Um, as far as what our response looks like, um, basically, it, it's supposed to be very simple. We're, we're basically supposed to triage uh, to determine whether somebody is in immediate danger to themselves, others, or unable to care for themselves. If we find that they are a danger, uh, our goal is to uh, communicate with them, de-escalate the situation in hopes that they will uh, seek treatment voluntarily. Um, if they will not seek treatment voluntarily, that's when we have to start looking into taking them into custody involuntarily, taking them for an evaluation and starting that process. But our goal is always uh, kind of the least invasive uh, possible. You know, If they need assistance, let's find them the assistance. Um, and, and do it without causing an additional trauma, if you will. Um, again, that is supposed to be very simple. Uh, at the end of the day, we're just executing, whether it be a paper ECO or a paperless ECO, getting them to, before a professional and then providing transportation. That's, that's what our world is supposed to be and that's where, where it's supposed to end. Unfortunately, the process is not that simple. I know a lot of y'all on this call know that um, the laws can be confusing at times. They can be interpreted uh, differently by, by different players in the process. Um, uh, and, everything can be, and, and the resources can be very, very limited. And our hands are often tied by lack of resources. And I'll get into that here in a few minutes as well. Um, 
the type of calls that we handle can vary widely. Um, sometimes somebody calls 911. I'm just saying, <clears throat> just saying, hey, I'm, I'm having thoughts. I think I need to, to talk to somebody. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry about that. And they can uh, they can escalate all the way to a situation where somebody is actively harming themselves or somebody else. Um, so the, the gamut is, is, is large, I would say. Um, as far as uh, kind of what equips us to, to handle these calls, uh, there is basic um, education at every uh, police academy, if you will. Every law enforcement officer becomes certified, has to pass the law enforcement basic academy. And there is instruction on mental health response. Um, and there are state requirements that uh, officers must meet the minimum requirements before they can kind of wear the badge, if you will. It is very basic. Uh, when, when I went to that training many, many years ago, um, I kind of laugh at it now because the, the scenarios they give you at that time were, were so obvious um, that, that it would be difficult to, to make a mistake on recognizing whether somebody was in distress or not. And back then it was very simple. There was very few resources and, and the process that we took was very, very simple. It's fortunately changed. Um, my understanding is that training is much more in depth now, uh, much more focusing on de-escalation, which is a good thing. Um, and I think they're making the scenarios a little bit harder. So, so the training is getting better. Um, as far as additional training after the academy, uh, CIT is kind of the gold standard. Um, that is crisis intervention team training. It's a 40 hour class, um, generally taught by the local CSB. For us, it's Rappahannock Rapidan. Um, and it really expands upon the education we get in the basic academy. Um, I attended it for the first time a couple of years ago, and even with the years of experience I have, um, I found it very informative, uh, and I really appreciated the fact that it emphasized um, em empathy and, and using empathy to, to connect with individuals. Um, we've been focusing on trying to get uh, the majority of our staff uh, through that training. One of the problems we've had since the pandemic is uh, we had to cancel a lot of classes, and then once classes restarted, they were limited in how many attendees we could send. So we're still trying to play catch up on that. And that is a hardship that we're facing. Um, so we could certainly use more access to CIT training. And we're, we're trying to find uh, kind of other, other ways to get that training. Um, I got to talk about co-response at least briefly, because no matter how much training we give our officers, uh, having a co-responder uh, in the car with us um, is kind of a, a, a deal changer. They, they really see things that we don't see. Um, when we respond together, we make more better educated decisions. And a lot of times the outcome uh, is different. If, if a co-responder is with us and we collectively discuss the case and determine that, that somebody needs an evaluation, odds are they're probably going to be hospitalized. Whereas if the officer is trying to make that decision themselves, they just don't have that education and experience that a clinician does. So uh, the co-response program has really helped us uh, on these situations, and, and I expect it will continue to do so. Um, as far as what we're seeing currently, uh, let me see, can I share my screen? Will that work? Let's see here. Right. Did that go through? Yes. OK. So here's some data um, that I can share. Um, as far as uh, this data, just to clarify, is just for our for the sheriff's office. It does not include Warrenton PD or uh, Virginia State Police in Fauquier County. This is just what we're seeing on our end. Um, last year, as you can see, we had 280 mental health calls. Uh, that is the most since we've uh, started collecting this data, which is in 2018. So we are seeing an increase. Um, I don't know that I'd call it a drastic increase. Um, but we are seeing an increase. Um, you can see the other numbers for the last few years there now. Um, we often get asked about the pandemic and, and how it uh, affected the calls. Um, you can see kind of in the thick of the shutdown in 2020, um, we did not see an increase. Uh, we have seen an increase ever since then, 21, 22, and potentially if our, our, if our data keeps going the way it is for 2023, that, that, is, that is continuing to climb. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so far in 2023, just through April, we've already had 112 uh, calls for service uh, related to mental health. 
Um, so like I said, if we continue that rate, uh, we're, we're gonna exceed last year's numbers. Uh, interestingly enough though, we are seeing a decrease in ECOs. Um, I, I, I think we probably still need to look at some more data before I can speculate on what that may be. But again, kind of one of the, uh, one of the goals for the co-response program is to reduce this number. Um, that we only take people into custody when we absolutely have to, and there's not other resources that we can put into play. So I, I hope, and, I, and I'd like to say that that is, um, that is a result of the co-response program, but I think we still need to keep watching that to, to, to just to solidify that a little bit more. In addition to ECOs going down, we are also seeing a reduction in TDOs, which is also a good thing. Um, so we are sending fewer people uh, involuntarily to the hospital for treatment. Um, all, all good things. It's just the number of calls that we're running um, is on the rise, which is interesting. Uh, we also track other numbers. I'm just kind of a data guy. Uh, so especially when we started doing the co-response program, we, we really wanted to see uh, if there was any, any kind of trends as far as uh, when people are calling us for help. Um, really to just to deploy the resources properly and appropriately. We don't have, you know, co-response at, at, at best, we get 40 hours a week out of, out of, of that program. So it's important that we deploy them um, with, with some sort of common sense or, or, or strategic uh, thought behind it. Uh, so as you can see, what we've noticed is interestingly enough, most of these calls are during the week um, and, and not so much on the weekend. Uh, as far as time of day, uh, we've noticed kind of the, uh, the high point is 10 a.m. till about 11, 10, 11, 12 o'clock uh, in, in the evening. So those are the times we really focus our co-response program to try to hit the, uh, the high points, high usage points. Um, months, haven't seen a whole lot uh, there every once in a while. Um, you know, the, the winter months or the holiday months or sometimes the month of April, we'll see spikes. Um, but I can't really say we've noticed a trend as far as that goes. Um, let's see here. And data is really important because without the data, we really wouldn't know what to implement or what hours or what months or things like that. So the data is always super helpful to, to be able to see what kind of, kind of programs are needed or what times of days um, co-responders are needed the most. So definitely that data is super, super helpful to have. Absolutely. And if I can figure out a pattern, I'll, uh, I'll write a book and I'll make a lot of money. But, Perfect. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll read it. <laughs> well, this is great information, Lieutenant Marshall. We really do appreciate it and always keep collecting that data because that's what we really need um, to, to really focus our energy and see what we can do, um, what additional resources we can add for sure. So thank you for that information Absolutely. and all that data. Now we're going to go ahead and um, go to mental health in the schools. So Donna, I know that teachers, administrators, everyone's really strained as are the students and their families from the trauma over the past several year years. Um, can you please share with us how the situation in the schools is now in 2023 compared to January of 2020? Sure, absolutely. Um, I don't have it um, handy to put on my screen and I'm afraid if I try to share it, I'm gonna mess it up. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit, um, but we did put out um, the Virginia division-wide safety audit um, 21-22 and that was presented um, at a school board meeting. So when I um, look back at the school safety survey and the school climate survey, you're gonna see that um, it, it's basically the same information. Um, when administrators were asked what their greatest concerns are um, at the time, school safety training and mental health problem awareness and recognition, training and threat assessment procedures and de-escalation and alternatives to suspension were their biggest concerns. Um, and when you look at the school climate survey data as well, uh, the biggest concerns expressed by students were feelings of anxiety, other mental health related issues, sad or hopeless thoughts or feelings. Um, and then there was a prevalence of student teasing and bullying was something else that um, was mentioned. Um, and so, um, you know, when I go further to look at like our threat assessment, because we do have threat assessment and suicide assessment on um, procedures and we keep that data. Um, 
it, it is a bit disheartening, I want to say. Um, so when I looked at the 2021 data, we had a total um, of threat and um, suicide assessment combined at 84. 21 to 22 was 177 combined. Um, and then as of today, 192 have been done um, in this school year. Um, and of the ones um, of the threat assessments, um, it was 73 73 violent, um, coded as violent. Um, and when I look at the suicide assessments, total number was 117 this year. Um, and it was approximately half that were rated uh, moderate to high or high. Um, so that is super high and extreme. Um, and if you were to dig deeper, you would find, um, unfortunately, even at the elementary school age, that has increased significantly. Um, and so it is a huge concern from administrators, you know, all the way around to all of us. Um, and so, yes, the challenge is, is just, you know, there is not enough mental health professionals, like even in the school building, um, our poor elementary schools, um, to go back to that, even you'll, you know, usually only have two to 300 total students maybe in a building, some are a little bit higher than that. And you have one counselor, at some points, if we were lucky to have one counselor, some of them had maybe a half-time person and then we were sharing. Um, and it's not because we don't want them or need them. We're advertising and we can't just seem to get uh, counselors in the building. And with the need increase, you probably could use at least two counselors um, per school building. Um, when you look at middle schools, um, we have one and a half. Um, and I can tell you as just being a middle school principal, that's not enough. Um, we have social workers, thank goodness, who usually deal with um, our special needs students, but they have been more than willing to try and, you know, help us um, meet some of the need. And it, it and it's just a huge struggle. Um, of course, the high schools have um, many more counselors, but again, when you talk to counselors in general, and this is anecdotally, they will tell you that they are spending so much time trying to deal with these extreme cases um, of anxiety, depression, um, suicidal ideations, that they can't spend the time that they need to hopefully try and maybe and help prevent or deal with some more mild cases that hopefully wouldn't turn into um, these extreme cases. Um, you know, typically counselors would be meeting with um, each class, especially at an elementary level, and then there would be small groups based on maybe you have kids that have anxiety or have, you know, test taking, you know, anxieties or um, issues in the home, and they would be able to pull small groups. Um, but because of the extreme need right now, it's been a real challenge um, to be more preventative um, and helpful up front. And we are just dealing with um, these really hard cases. Um, and so we have, um, and I can't remember because I'm just going to blank right now, but partnered um, through the Mental Health Coalition with one of our, maybe Renee is going to help me or somebody will step in, maybe Bridget. Um, we started a pilot through our high schools. Can you, can you who is that, who's that with? Youth for Tomorrow. That's it. Okay. <laughs> with Youth for Tomorrow. Um, and so because students were having to leave, right, to try and get these, um, this counseling in. Um, and one, as you all know, is that there's not just not enough counseling available even outside um, to help the students, um, you know, go outside. So we've partnered with them where students can get counseling, stay in the building, get their you know, 45 minutes to an hour of counseling and then go back to class with not having to leave. Um, and, and it has just been, I think, a huge help. And, you know, we're starting to utilize that um, in, you know, middle and um, elementary. So hopefully um, we'll be able to expand some of that. But those are like the greatest challenges. Um, and so just the continued, you know, training and awareness, I think, through our suicide and threat assessments is just, you know, continuing to train um, staff um, and students to look for signs of mental health um, issues and then reporting those. And I, I, you know, I struggle with what it is. I think sometimes people think they'll get somebody in trouble. And so like, not reporting it and waiting too long and then you know something terrible could happen so it, it's just that constant um training um and with students um if anybody's been watching any of the school board meetings um we're trying to get um sel um into middle school we have it currently at the elementary school level and we were trying to expand and 
you can go back and look. There's um, there's a for and an against um, for different reasons. Um, but whatever we do, we cannot throw our hands up um, in the air and say, well, it's just not going to happen. And so we are constantly looking for ways, whether that's programs and assemblies and, and, and things, ways to um, address the issue because it it's definitely not going away. I just, it's gotten, it's gotten really bad um, and we need to help our kids. So. Absolutely. It, it, it seems to be escalating a lot more and it, you know, it even touched home with me. My niece started to get bullied and she's in middle school and she's never really experienced that before. So trying to help her cope and find different methods to deal with that. And I know that counselors are just doing their best and um, that's all they can really do at this point. So it really is, is hitting home with everybody, to be honest. And hopefully we can um, find more help and resources for our teachers and for our students, honestly. So thank you for all of that information, Donna. Um, and Alec. Hello. You're it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. it. Wow. You're, you're, you're our last, but you know, not <laughs> least. Um, so we'll touch with you. We know that the lack of treatment of mental health conditions costs American companies billions each year. And according to a Kaiser Permanente study, 50% of full-time employees have left a role for mental health reasons. And those numbers are significantly higher for millennial and Gen Zers. Can you shed some light on workforce and business related trends that correlate with mental health now and before the pandemic? Sure. You know, I, 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 first of all, thank you for, for having me here. I mean, and, and, and equally thank you for all the three presenters prior. I mean, I, I was taking notes. I, I learned quite a bit as well. Uh, I'm not the subject matter expert by any stretch in this in this area, but I, I did do some research on this because I found the topic uh, not only uh, relevant, but but certainly I propose from the standpoint of the Chamber of Commerce. And, you know, just starting out kind of with some numbers more. Well, let me back up a little bit. When we talk about workforce, I, I want to make sure that, you know, personally, I look at um, you know all all the citizens. Um, you know there's a certain obviously a segment, a percentage of the of the workforce that is represented by the entire uh, uh, state and certainly here in our county. But I, I think you know looking at, at behavioral health and mental issues by segments is is some perhaps maybe not the best way to approach it. I think you need to look at all the segments uh, and 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 look at the big the bigger picture. Um, you know workers that are mentally unstable they go home. Uh, you know, the, the, we, we saw, you know, from 10 a.m. till 10 p.m., we saw some of the highest numbers in calls. So, you know, although we like to leave the issues at the office, sometimes that just doesn't happen. So to have two separate conversations, which I know we're not necessarily having here, but I, I think is is disturbing to the to to trying to, um, um, you know, find a find a, 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 a solution or, or at least a discussion for solutions. So. I was do, doing some digging up on some some polls and some statistics and found that you know, roughly 45% of adults across the U.S. report that COVID in some manner had to negatively impact, impact their mental health. Um, we've got roughly four and a half million um, workforce um, uh, residents here in the state of Virginia. So you're looking at, at if you if you use the 45% rule, you know, you're looking at, at just over two million people are, are affected by it. Um, you know, some would say, well, two is too many. I, I would, and I would agree with that, but certainly two million um, is, is, a, is a big number. Um, and, and what we found, or what they would found was that a lot of these um, uh, mental health issues were focused on, uh, in the front line and first responders. So law enforcement, uh, fire, EMS workers, hospital staff, uh, long-term care, uh, behavioral health and developmental disability staff, um, as well as even uh, delivery drivers and grocery store workers. Um, and when you look at that, those findings and against what our top industries are here in the county, um, government is, 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 our, is our largest industry per se, but right beneath that is, is, is healthcare and healthcare services. So when you're looking at, um, if you pick apart the industries that are most affected, you can see the correlation uh, that, that impacts us directly here in Fauquier County. Uh, one of the reasons behind it, they were saying was the, um, uh, the, the heightened stress and, and workload is a result of, you know, the increased costs from PPE, um, telehealth equipment, and, and some of these other expenses that a lot of the, whether they're for-profit or NGOs, just didn't have in their budgets. Uh, nobody expected it. Um, so, you know, in some cases, they were either required to or had no choice to 
um, you know, allocate budgetary funds to um, uh, products uh, that, that 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 weren't necessarily part of the part of the plan. So as a result, you got a little bit of a Rob Peter pay Paul uh, kind of scenario. So uh, reduced staff, uh, reduced um, um, uh, abilities for for staff to do their jobs. Obviously, the more you reduce that, the the, the, the higher the increase of uh, of incidents of stress, which then obviously leads into mental health and addiction and the whole thing just it just snowballs. Um, so, you know, what do we do about it? recognizing it is obviously the first step, um, but then, you know, discussing and, and outlining some pragmatic, uh, you know, ideas and plans um, is, is, is really the next step. And I don't know if it's, I, I do believe it did pass the, the House and the Senate budget, uh, Youngkin's um, proposed budget, but he did have a program that I came across called the Right Help Right Now program, um, which is really kind of interesting. It's addressing a number of different aspects uh, of the workforce, but in particular, it is focusing uh, on uh, addiction as well as behavioral um, um, and, uh, behavioral and mental health. Uh, it's a six pillared approach um, that's addressing you know behavioral health challenges, uh, crisis care, law enforcement burden. Uh, substance use um, and behavioral health worth workforce and service delivery innovations. So those are the kind of the, the, the targeted areas that they're looking at impacting with this right here, right now program uh, with the centerpiece of this being, uh, it's a three-year program, first of all, and this, but the centerpiece uh, would include a $20 million proposal to fully fund 30 or more uh, new mobile crisis teams to respond um, to uh, Virginia's 988 hotline. Um, and with that funding, the governor's commitment um, to overall behavioral health uh, is topping out at $660 million. So uh, whether it hits that number or whatever, but when you, it, the, the point here is that, um, you know, the policymakers, the decision makers, those that, that, that we as the citizens and business owners um, put in a position to ensure our safety, well-being, growth, and prosperity uh, are, are, are certainly not sweeping this under the rug. Uh, they, uh, it, it's to me in, in reading it, it, it's not a lot of talk. It's, it's, it's more than that. It's actually action plans. Um, and of course, anything that has, that is going to happen obviously needs funding. And so with these big numbers, um, and looking at the budget, uh, you know, again, it was a little bit of Robin Peter to pay Paul in some areas of the budget that, uh, uh, that got a little bit less, uh, in order so that the funding for those things such as, um, uh, mental health, um, could be, um, have a higher uh, degree of, of funding. Um, a couple of other the numbers, uh, looking at uh, 9 million bucks to expand tele uh, behavioral health services in public schools and on college campuses. Uh, I know that we were just talking about, obviously, we've done it with, with the schools. I think it's important to call out as well uh, that colleges are not excluded from this. Um, you know, there's, you know, you have, you know, COVID affected everybody in, in, in different periods of their lives. And um, yes, we need, obviously need to focus on, on the youth, but that doesn't mean at the expense of people that might be uh, further along in pursuing their careers or, or, or further along in their careers. Um, so of those six pillars, the specifics you know, are, are, number one, they strive to ensure same-day care uh, for individuals that are experiencing issues. Um, I mean, I don't think that there's probably any argument with that. You know, it's, it really is more of a, uh, what we call kind of the early involvement process. The sooner you're aware uh, of a situation, uh, the more responsibility you have uh, to, to act on it, um, and especially when it comes down to uh, mental health. Secondly, um, relieve law enforcement's burden, um, uh, reduce the criminalization of, of mental health. Um, you know, that, that obviously is a, is a larger conversation and involves uh, many other stakeholders. <laughs> but, you know, I think we, we, we as citizens, we, uh, we, we, we tend to, uh, you know, believe, and, and as we should, that there are people here to protect and serve us. Um, and that's great. However, um, you know, that isn't always the case. And it's uh, sometimes, unfortunately, it's, it's a result of, of, of factors that are out of the control of, of the first responders, the police, the fire, et cetera. Again, going back to budget allocations, equipment, um, and, and ability to serve on that immediate need. Uh, third, uh, developing a, a, a more capacity uh, throughput in the system going beyond hospitals um, and looking more at uh, the community-based services. Um, interestingly enough, I was in a meeting this morning, we were talking about kind of, we, we do this kind of question roundtable, you know, what are your 
uh, uh, favorite or, or most preferred, you know, nonprofits. And, and, and I, I didn't have one because I, <laughs> I kind of pulled away. I said, no, I, I can't really do that necessarily because I'm obviously involved with so many of them, but listening around the room, um, was, was, uh, was, was number one, interesting. The fact that nobody really had to think about it. You know, there are so many, uh, wonderful organizations out there that are doing wonderful things. Uh, and clearly, uh, um, I, I would say probably the majority of them have some element of, of behavioral health uh, involved with it, um, because it is such a uh, such a uh, prolific and a prominent issue that we're facing right now in Fog Gear. Um, the fourth is uh, target support for substance abuse uh, disorders and and uh, look to prevent the overdoses. Uh, I remember my time on time on town council back in 2016. Um, um, with um, um, uh, Lou, Lou Battle uh, was, was, would bring to us the reports of, of, of opioid overdoses. And there was this thing that we were aware of that was called Narcan. Um, and it cost $500 a shot. And this is 2016. Um, if you think about, just do the math, 2016 to 2023, um, whereas in 2016, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. First of all, the Narcan doses were roughly about $500. Uh, they were only in with certain officers and maybe certain cars, et cetera. Five years later, um, the cost has gone down, and 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 I wouldn't be surprised if every officer, uh, you know, has uh, you know has them on their hip, uh, kind of like a like a Batman belt or something. And so, it, the the point being that it's a it's the bad side of supply and demand. Um, the the demand has increased, so therefore the supply has 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 as well uh, to meet that demand. Um, and I think that's a, um, a rather stark reminder if we were to chart that out, uh, if we look at the opioid incidents, um, overdoses and, and deaths, I, I think it would be a very, very, very scary uh, trend line. Um, fifth is uh, making the uh, behavioral health uh, workforce a priority um, and particularly in the underserved areas, um, which we all know a lot of times it's the, it's the audience, the largest audience and the loudest audience that, that gets the most attention. And, um, and, and which is fine, but to my earlier point, certainly not at the expense of other communities or populations or areas that uh, perhaps are underserved. Uh, so, um, you know, not necessarily advocating anything particularly here in Falk here, uh, but just saying that, you know, we are all humans, uh, regardless of boundaries and borders, and uh, we have a responsibility um, to, to, to look at the big picture. Uh, there's some very tough choices that our, our leaderships has to make sometimes, but um, that's why we elect them. So, um, and if we don't like it, then we, we, we elect change. Um, and then uh, on the sixth side, on the, the, the sixth pillar uh, is identifying some innovations and some best practices. So pre-crisis prevention services, crisis care, et cetera. Um, and then equally post-crisis recovery and support, uh, you know, once somebody is, uh, uh, is maybe perhaps gotten through an incident, um, you know, what, what are, I'm asking, it's a rhetorical statement, but, you know, what processes, plans, uh, abilities are there for um, uh, what was before a reaction um, area services to more of a proactive services? What are we doing to, uh, what can we do to the, to these uh, residents and, 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 and workforce members that, um, uh, can help abate um, um, incidents from happening uh, further. Uh, and the more that we do that, then we create advocates for the program and it can proliferate itself around. Uh, so I think that's a very, uh, a very important part of that sixth goal. And then the final uh, element of the sixth goal is uh, developing tangible and achievable means of closing any kind of capacity gaps, uh, which kind of dovetails a little bit back into um, uh, you know, large communities versus underserved communities, et cetera. So, you know, being equitable, being, um, um, you know, making sure that we're not just, uh, um, you know, focusing in on uh, perhaps the, you know, the, the high uh, target areas that are maybe more, um, uh, have a higher instance of awareness or um, any other variety of things. You know, uh, a lot of times the uh, underserved communities are, are the ones that kind of fly under the radar um, and um, you, you turn your back um, and then, you know, pull 180 degrees and you realize that you've got a much larger problem that had you, um, you know, not only been aware of it earlier on, but had applied some of the uh, just practical um, uh, you know, prevention uh, practices uh, might have been able to abate or even in, in some good cases mitigate it entirely. So 
Um, it, there's there's a, a really good uh, information on um, on the on the uh, on the program that's available uh, online, uh, the Right Help uh, Right Now program, and it is um, uh, being implemented by the Department of Behavioral um, Health. It's whatever that acronym is. I can't remember. It's one of those long ones. But it is a uh, it, it is part of the administration uh, under the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, so it is this is not an adjunct or a one off, um, um, you know, a, a program which sometimes those programs don't get a lot of the attention um, and therefore can make it difficult for them to be sustainable. But this is a three year program, and um, I think it's something that uh, we as as uh, residents and 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 business folks uh, here in this community should be aware of. And if we believe it's the right approach, we should advocate for it and um, um, you know, make sure that uh, it's providing the services that it's intended to do to all of us. Absolutely, thank you. And I know Bridget posted a link in the chat. So if you all are interested in learning more about what Alec was just talking about, she has posted that link. Um, and now, really, honestly, everyone, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for all that information. I know we've all learned a lot um, from today's discussion, and we hope to continue to collaborate together to find um, solutions for um, the needs of our community. And now we're going to open it up to any questions from the audience or from our panelists. So please, if you have a question, you can just raise your hand or speak up and we will call on you. Does anybody have a question for either Bridget or Renee at the Mental Health Association? I have a question for uh, Ms. Donna and for uh, Lieutenant Marshall. For uh, uh, Donna, how you doing? Vinnie Holland, how you doing? Um, in the increase in uh, mental health I issues, the outbreaks of suicide, doesn't, is it noticeable that it's around test time or prom time or holidays about to happen? Did we see an increase, like when the kids are going to have to go home for a period of time during break, or is it just any time during the school year these are, these things are occurring? Yeah, I mean, overall, just in general, it's it's just been a huge um, increase. Um, I haven't noticed any trends, but um, that might be interesting data that I can try and see if I see any, you know, differences um, in dates. But I just, it, I, I don't really see it off the top of, you know, looking at it. It's just increase, especially, like I said, at the elementary. I think that has been the most surprising for us. Lieutenant, uh, Mar Lieutenant yeah. Marshall, I know you, I, I saw your daddy, he said during the week from 10 a.m. said there was a spike, but on the weekends, it goes down. What do you attribute that to, or that is down on the weekends when everybody seems to be, I don't know, that seems yeah. backwards to me. I thought the same thing when we first started tracking it, that really surprised me because a lot of times our call volume for certain types of you know violent crime or, or some different things go up on the weekends. Um, but when it comes to uh, the, the need for mental health services, we, we noticed the, the increase during the week. I, I, I can't say why, but it's definitely there. We've been tracking it for several years now. It's been consistent. Thank you. While you're all, all are thinking of questions you might want to ask, I just want to um, share that this is kind of this, today's presentation was kind of an example of what the Mental Health Association does uh, with our stakeholder groups. We try to get representatives from different organizations to kind of share their perspective and so we can come up with um, solutions on how to address things. And while we are, you know, advocating and um, trying to talk about some of the larger issues that Alec pointed out, you know, in the Right Help Right Now plan. We are trying to do some like smaller scale preventative um, efforts and um, geared towards community wellness. Uh, we recently partnered with um, Parks and Rec um, to start some wellness walks and we encourage everyone to come out and attend those if you can. Um, we have these lunch and learns on a regular basis and we're at a lot of community events just to talk to um, community members and see what their issues are and try to connect them to services whenever available. We also have a faith um, community council and we try to do outreach with the faith community and that really helps us reach some of the underserved. Um, and Renee, please jump in if you could think of anything else you wanna share, it's important. I do, before Renee does that, I do wanna say um, as an uplifting kind of closing, round this all out, um, we're developing a 
kind of crowdsource a playlist, a motivational playlist. So if you have your favorite most motivational song, you want to drop it in the chat, please do so. I know this seems kind of irrelevant to some of the heavier topics we're talking about, but it's all about being connected and doing what we can within our own environment to kind of improve the situation in our own mental health. So it is. And Bridget talked a little bit about prevention. And we do have our wellness walks that we've partnered with Parks and Rec. And if you come on a wellness walk, you get these cute little fanny packs. <laughs> so come on out and walk with us. But please. Hey, I'm sorry, Renee. This is uh, Gary Rapecki with the sure. parks. Uh, uh, we also have the Mental Health Awareness Month proclamation tonight at the Board of Supervisors. So I assume you're going to be there. Mm -hmm. Great. So that'll also help get the word out. That'll be great. Just one question. This is statistical. Do you, and this is a, this is an opinion. Um, do you think any of this data that we're getting now on the instances is skewed because we're more aware or more in tune since the pandemic about what's going on with other people besides ourselves? That's anybody. I mean, I definitely think there has been a push if I'm talking just about the school level, um, again, like the awareness of signs and symptoms, the the utmost importance of making sure you are reporting, whether that's, you know, students reporting about it or adults. And so I think that has maybe created a slight increase, um, but I still, I don't think that's the main driver. Yeah. The Youth Mental Health first, cra um, first Aid Crisis actually began about seven or eight years ago and just was exacerbated by that COVID. We know that the introduction of the cell phone and that youth crisis are parallel. Um, in fact, the um, American um, Psych... No, the APA just came out with a report on the dangers of social media for teens. And so we'll be sharing that across our different spaces. But um, there are positive ways to use phones, but we're also noticing, especially for the little ones, um, parents' use of cell phones tends to take attention away from those small ones and they lose huge um, learning opportunities when they aren't um, interacting well with their parents. So we're going to look into that as well in the future. But the other thing before anyone signs off and in case anyone else has any questions, we also know the Surgeon General, you know, re, um, put out that report on loneliness and the power of connection. And so I challenge you all today and for the rest of the week to go make connections. Even if you're walking into a doctor's office, instead of sitting at a chair away from everyone, sit down and start up a conversation or in the line at the grocery store or call somebody you haven't talked to in a while. We know also through research that those spontaneous connections actually have more of a protective factor than scheduled connections. So go out and connect with the world. So here's a shameless, uh, a shameless promotion, but the Chamber of Commerce is a wonderful organization for networking and communication. Um, and coincidentally, we have an after five uh, a social event in Old Town uh, tonight at Meridian Financial. All are all are welcome. Uh, all are welcome to all of the chamber events. Uh, so again, not you know, not being tongue in cheek on this, Renee, I think makes a very good point. Is that you know COVID obviously created a sense of of, of confinement, and uh, I'm sure there's numbers show that that is not good. Uh, so uh, uh, take control and uh, get out, like you said. Um, and uh, if you if you stumble across a chamber event, uh, just know that you'll be embraced. And um, you never know who you might meet. And Alec, let me give you another plug. So uh -oh. um, the, the young professional group of the chamber is very active. And so if you know any young professionals, and by the way, there's no age. It doesn't have to be like only a certain age. It could be young at heart. Um, they meet once a month at Deja Brew with an Ask the Expert. And I got to be the expert this week. Yep. Um, very great way of just sitting down with coffee and talking to members of your community. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you for that. The, the young professionals is, uh, you know, clearly our youth is our future. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, we must uh, do everything we can to, to support them and, and, and provide them the guidance that they're that they're looking for. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, we risk uh, we risk a lot. So uh, thank you for that uh, for that plug for the young professionals.
I also want to share that the Mental Health Association does um, offers mental health um, first aid training for youth and adults, and we're trying to get more of those classes out. Um, I know the chamber just sponsored one. We appreciate that. There was good attendance. So there's definitely a lot of people interested and in, um, helping out. And so we're encouraged by that. And so please take a look at our calendar and see what else is coming up and get involved. Thanks for Thank all you guys do. Thank you so much for our guests and panelists. We really appreciate everyone's participation and for the excellent information shared. And um, if anyone has any questions, reach out to Renee or myself. And we also have a great new employee who does all our social media and our social media is amazing now because of her, Christine. And um, so we thank and you. Thanks, Yesenia, for a great moderation. Oh, yes. Thank you, guys. Thanks, thank you so much. <laughs> well done, well done. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. Bye, guys. Bye. Take care, everyone. Take care.